Okay, hello everybody. We're trying this again, hopefully this time with the correct title of Silverline 101 with Barb Kalberg, who has been incredibly patient through all of my goofs and mistakes here. Uh, but I think we are all good to go now. Uh, at least I hope we're all good to go and all the titles should be correct. I'm going to uh, look really quick and see if they are indeed correct. Um because my old friend Chris Knight came here thinking he was going to listen to um, us talk about music, which we, of course, were not doing. And good, it is uh, it is correct, because I see that uh, Becca has just shared it. Thank you very much, Becca, with the correct title there. So, whew, Barb, how you yes. doing? I'm good. Thank you. Good. So I'm going to ask you all kinds of questions tonight. Hopefully we get some questions from the folks who are watching as well, but I'm going to ask you all kinds of questions about you, about comics, about uh, how you got from, from baby Barb to right here today. And so first thing I'm going to ask you is what is, uh, what are your earliest memories of comic books? Now I don't mean you working in them, but I mean, okay. Earliest memories of you holding comic books. What what are those earliest memories you have? Well, actually, it wasn't comic books, but comic strips. I was a huge fan of the Sunday comics. Um, I followed Steve Canyon because I thought he was cute. Um, I read Little Abner because, believe it or not, my father was a dead ringer for Little Abner. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, the really broad shoulders, uh, slim hips, uh, black, really tall, black hair, um, did, really did, tall. Did he have the uh, the uh, grain stalk in his uh, in his? Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes he was a farmer. Yeah, yep. he was raised on a farm. So, and you know, all little girls are slightly in love with their daddies. Um, yep. When they're real little, and I'm just like, oh, daddy's in the comics. <laughs> so um, that that was I like that one. Um, and later on, I was a big fan of Garfield. And I still follow Luann on, uh, online. Really? Oh, well, yeah. I was going to ask you, you know, we don't we don't see a whole lot of uh, comic strips anymore. Uh, and in fact, even in my class, you know, I, I, I mentioned them so that students will know the difference between strips and, and comics. But, um, you know, the newspapers have kind of gone away. And so where do you where do you read your comic strips now? Um, there's a. There's an online site for comic strips. I can't remember the name of it, but you can just um, Google comic strips online. Um, my cousin, Terry Beatty, does Rex Morgan. Um, Wait, Terry Beatty is your cousin? Yes, he is. Really? Mm -hmm. <laughs> wow, I did not know that. Small world, I know. Wow, that's very cool. So, um, so your, so your, your dad. Now, did uh, you, um, did your mom and your siblings, because you have a brother and a sister, mm -hmm. uh, did they also uh, read uh, comics? Oh comics yeah, we books? had to sh we had to share the the paper around. You know, my father got it first. Yeah, of course. Then the kids got them after that. <laughs> and you know, there's always a few Donald Duck uh, um, comics floating around for whatever reason. I don't even remember where we got them. Probably, you know cousins or something like that. Yeah. But uh, those floated around. And it wasn't until um, I started working at the Rexall drug store when I was wow. 15 years old. And, and really? I started I started at 90 cents an hour. Um, this was back wow. in the early 70s. So um, or mid 70s. And I started at the age of 15, working as a clerk. And one of my jobs was to go to the spinner rack and take off all the old comics that hadn't sold. Yeah. Tear the cover off so that the owner could send them back to the distributor because he got so many cents on the dollar yeah. back for the books that he didn't sell. And I was supposed to throw out the rest into the dumpster in the back. Well, the dumpster in the back happened to be my car trunk. So, <laughs> yeah. So and, you know, I had a lot of comics without covers. And of course, it was uh, it was illegal for for people to um, sell those with the covers ripped off of them. But I can remember as a kid buying dozens of those from the the used bookstores. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, hey, Oven says hello, Roland and Barbara. Hey, Oven. Hey, Hi, Oven. Make sure you come up with some hard questions for Barb. Now we need we need questions for. Her. Um, so, uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, an, uh, a, a drugstore, uh, with a spinner rack. 
Um, so now you're 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 a farm gal. Yep. You grew up on. Now I, you're, I'm gonna ask you to forgive me here. You grew up on a farm in Iowa, or it was in Iowa. It was oh, a very yeah, small yeah. town, I, three miles out of town. The town was 2,500 people. My graduating class had 80 people in it. Wow, mine too. So it was a small, yeah. small yeah. community. Um, so now what kind of, what kind of responsibilities did you have? Because, you know, everyone on a farm works, everyone in a fa farm family works. Oh, yeah. Yeah. What were some of your responsibilities as a, as a farm girl? Uh, I, I did a lot of mowing when I was younger. I mean, I'm talking like 12. Yeah. Um, and we, cause we had like two or three acres to mow. Um, I drove our international harvester pickup for the first time when I was 12. <laughs> cool. By the time I was 16, I was, um, I was hiring out as a uh, as farm help to rake and and bale hay. Oh my goodness! Uh, yeah, and um, I learned how to plow and disc. So, yep. Yeah. By the time I was like seventeen, eighteen years old, well, I loved farm. I loved being a farm hand. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, you know, most of the most of the times I talk to anybody, you know, I'm from a farm family as well. I didn't really do any farming, but I am I'm from a farm family. Um, so, you know, anytime I talk to people, though, they're they're from from a farm. They're like, yeah, I enjoyed the farm. It was hard, but I enjoyed uh, the, the farm work. Now, um, you do you don't do you I, I know that you have recently retired. Are there any plans of yours to uh, return to any kind of farming life at all or? No, I'm I'm a suburban uh, housewife now. I've got a garden in the back, but it's basically a salsa garden. <laughs> um, Lots of tomatoes, I hope. Yeah, I do can. So there's okay. there's a throwback. I mean, yeah. up until the mid '70s, we were pretty self sufficient. We had an acre or more um, garden vegetable garden. We had an acre in in uh, sweet corn. That's a big um, garden. It is. Um, we had uh, orchard uh, grapes, strawberries. Uh, we had cattle and and hogs. So we butchered every fall and. Put up a year's worth of meat, a year's worth of vegetables, fruit. You know, wow. we were pretty self-sufficient. And then I always like to tease. This isn't exactly true, but I always like to tease that. Then my uh, in the late seventies, my father discovered frozen pizza, and, it, and then it was all over. You know, so. <laughs> but in yeah. truth, my mom went to work, and then, and that kind of went by the wayside. We uh, started, you know, buying our groceries in. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, it makes it difficult when there's there, there's no one being full time there at the home to to do all that. Um, so how did so how did you uh, how did you move from comic strips to comic books then? Well, like I said, when I was working at the Rexall, I started taking the comics home and reading most of them. And I um, and this is where the part that we talked about last night. Uh, you know, teenage girls are just every bit as bad as teenage boys when it comes to. <laughs> To a uh, hyper to, ra to raging hormones, yes, to yeah. <laughs> uh, hyper muscled or uh, uh, anatomy type of uh, male or female, and I I fell in love with um, Mike Grell's Warlord, Travis Lord. Morgan. You know, I mean, here here's a here's a good looking guy with with a little uh, goatee and the, mm -hmm. and the white hair, and he's running around and. In a skull cod piece. I mean, how, come on! That's fourteen. This is great stuff. <laughs> well, you, you know, I, I find it, it funny that it's uh, it's Warlord because he's you know Warlord wasn't a real. Um, I mean, I, I don't know where it would fall in the in the selling list, but it certainly wasn't at the top of of uh, DC's uh, popular characters. So I found it interesting that it's Warlord and not someone like, say, Batman or Aquaman or Superman. Robin was a close second, you know, night not the not the not the junior Robin with the little uh, tights and the and the and the little booties that had the little wing on the back. Um, I like the older Robin, the the teenage Robin. Uh, gotcha. And then he, he became Nightwing, so I I kind of liked that as well. So yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of characters that uh, that were appealing. Um, I mean, later on, I, I became a huge Avengers fan, you know, mm. and I was a Tony Stark fan then. Okay. And, again, I think 
uh, he had a beard too, isn't he? Yeah. Well, he, yeah. He's got that beard thing yeah. finished going on, don't I? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so for those of you who are watching, we've been joined by uh, Thomas Formonti. Uh, actually, we've been joined by Thomas Formonti's iPad. And uh, Tommy has agreed to uh, do some inking uh, for your visual entertainment while uh, while we quiz Barb on uh, her life and her her uh, comic background. Um, so uh, so you had a, a, a crush on Tony Stark and on uh, on Warlord. Yeah, Travis Morgan. Yeah, Travis so. Morgan. You know what? I don't know what it is. I know who Warlord is, and and, and I, I have a you know a chunk of Warlords. I just uh, uh, probably only read them once when I, you know, when I bought them and then just never, it wasn't one of the, like the Avengers, I went back to time and time again. Mm -hmm. uh, Warlord, I, I, I didn't do that. Um, and I know it's it's like anathema, but Captain America never did anything for me. I thought he was a stick in the mud. <laughs> uh, he's self-righteous. I just didn't, I didn't like him. Uh, I like the rebel, um, Tony Stark. It's, well, it's something about the bad boys, I guess. <laughs> So did you did you kind of think think the same thing about uh, Superman then? Yeah, he was yeah. kind of boring. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a common goody two shoes. Yeah, that's I think that's kind of a common theme. Um, so at what point in time then did um, what are what are some of the first uh, before we get there? What are some of the first creator names that you can rem uh, me remember recognizing that? Oh, there's somebody behind. Uh, I've already forgotten his name. Travis Morgan. There's someone behind uh, Tony Stark creating them. When, when do, what, what names do you first recall? Can, can you remember any of those? Not when I was a teenager. It wasn't yeah. actually I became interested in becoming a professional in the industry that I, that I started picking up on these names. And actually, I came in very backwards. So when I got into the industry, I didn't know half of the name of names of the creators. And I didn't know when I was at a convention, whether I was talking to a creator, a fan or the janitor. <laughs> really? <laughs> so I just talked to everybody the same. And, and remarkably that worked very, very well in, in uh, making friends in the creators uh, with the creators because they were so, uh, they were so relieved and refreshed to have somebody who, you know, wasn't so awestruck with what yeah. they did because I didn't know what they did. Yeah. Yeah. You, know? you didn't, so. you, you didn't, uh, you didn't fan Gaga over them. No, I have a yeah. famous Bernie Wrightson story that I'll tell later that, that highlights that. Yeah. So, well, so at what point in time then did you, um, so you, you say so you backed into it. So what did you first start off doing? Well, I, I lost interest in comics after I got out of high school and left that job. And then I went to college and I, I spent most of my time reading high fantasy. Okay. Um, what, did, what did you study in college? Advertising design. Really? Okay. Yeah. And um, I got married and I started a family and uh, was had little kids around the house. And I'm like, I am so bored. <laughs> <laughs> I got to do something. <laughs> and I had, I was hanging out in Walden Books one day, and I ran across um, an ElfQuest graphic novel, mm. Sorrow's End. And I bought that, and I was immediately just sucked in. Hook, line, and sinker. I was in love and with the graphic novels. Um, became a huge ElfQuest fan. Um, started, and I'd always painted, um, done acrylic paintings um, mm -hmm. through most of my life and uh, in high school and college. And I did it um, for fun at home. So I started painting uh, the ElfQuest characters. And because they're copywritten, I never sold them. I never made a dime on it. I did it for my pure enjoyment. But I would give some of the paintings to some of my friends. And I made friends um, through the through the fandom, you know, mm -hmm. the fandom pages in the back of the books. Yeah. Um, ElfQuest fan clubs and stuff like that. I made friends and I would give some of these paintings to some of my ElfQuest friends. And they, one of them invited me to a science fiction convention in Chicago, WindyCon. Uh, and was WindyCon was the name of it? WindyCon in Chicago. It was a science fiction convention. It was the okay. first convention I had ever, ever attended. So I went there and I took some of my paintings and uh, Richard Peeney 
was actually a guest there that year and somebody gave him one of my paintings and he sought me out and said, I'd like to hire you. Really? Yeah. Yeah. He says, I want um, a painting, a three by three foot acrylic painting as a backdrop for our convention booth. Um, would you be interested in doing it? And this, this was my first contact, actual contact with anybody in the, in the comics industry. So during the course of painting this, you know, I was studying Wendy's work and um, her black and white work. And I'm using a brush to, to do all this colored painting. And I'm going, why don't I take this brush and ink comic books? And that gave me the germ of the idea and it's stuck. And it's just like, like wildfire. Yeah. I was all of a sudden, I was just impassioned that I was going to do this. I was going to become an inker. Uh, so after I finished the project, I, I decided I was going to go out to, and I picked, uh, of course, I picked the largest <laughs> convention you could possibly go to. I picked San Diego Comic-Con and I packed up everything, including the kitchen sink, which is exactly the wrong thing that you're not supposed to do. I, I put in there everything I'd done in high school, all yeah. my paintings, I mean, <laughs> yeah. characters, uh, you know anatomy uh, studies, everything in this humongous portfolio when I drug it all out to San Diego and um, took it around. And of course I just got, I got crucified. Yeah, <laughs> I can imagine. Do you remember, um, do you remember any of the people that you saw, any of the editors that you, you showed your portfolio to then? You're talking something like thirty some years ago. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do realize, and, and and of course, you know, this is not to not to say anything bad about any of them, but you know, sometimes sometimes you're like, oh, I remember I showed my work to Mark Gruenwald or to you know or to Steve Gerber or something like that, and and you know, you you, you don't remember any of them? Not really. I think yeah. there was probably David Campetti from Innovation. I'm okay. sure there was somebody from Malibu. Um, and so, so this, so, so you were, you weren't just hitting Marvel and DC, you were hitting everybody, everybody. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, my best experience at that convention, um, apart from getting completely uh, crucified, like I said before, the critiques were harsh and they were, yeah. but I listened to them, you know, I didn't take them personally. I listened to the critiques and that was, that was really important. They told me what I was doing wrong or what I needed to do right. Yeah. They told me how to put together a portfolio. They told me what to do. And then I went and I set it in seminars, how to seminars. Yeah. And um, which San Diego used to have a lot of. Yeah. At the time. And I sat in on a two hour seminar with Dick Giordano. And oh. it was the best seminar I had ever. He, he, he went from A to Z on exactly what you needed the, the materials, you know, the, the brushes. Um, he did samples. It was awesome. And I took notes like my life depended on it. Wow. Yeah, and, that's, that's cool. Yeah. And then I came home and I just did nothing for a solid year but practice my inking. I just filled pages after page after page with solid lines, circles, squiggly lines, just trying to learn <laughs> control. Um, then I got some samples. I got, um, I got samples from... Uh, Barry, uh, did Elf Lord, Barry Blair. Uh, got, Barry Blair, I, yeah. Barry Blair, I uh, got a bunch of samples from him. And um, of course, back then you could actually send a little self-addressed stamp yeah. envelope to companies. And, get and they would send back. you, they would send you photocopies back yeah. to practice on, which I did that too. Yeah. And I just practiced every single day for a year until I had such a Good control that I could make perfectly ruled lines with a brush. Nice. And nice. then I went out to San Diego the following year and landed my first job. Wow. So hang on, we're going to come back to your first job there. Uh, Cassisi says hello. Hey, Cassisi, uh, good to see you again this evening. Uh, Royal Airships has a question for us. He says, How did you find your own style and can you switch between styles? I have gotten fairly diverse. If, if a, an editor says, uh, can you give me more of a Jim Lee look? I can do that. I have my own style. It's, um, it's very fluid. Mm. 
um, very brush-like, but I can switch, I can imitate. I was one of the reasons I got my painting job um, for work graphics is because I'm a fantastic forger. <laughs> you know, I could forge Wendy's style in painting. When, yeah, meaning Wendy Penny from uh, yeah. uh, ElfQuest, yeah. Yeah, so... Um, I don't know that I've ever heard anyone say I'm a fantastic forger. I never did it for money. <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, no. I did, a, I, I did um, uh, a lot of different paintings. I forged them. But you know, I would make the argument, maybe you can agree or disagree with me here, but I would make the argument that um, in copying someone else's style like that, you actually learn the things that they do, and then you're able to take um, sometimes take the good, sometimes the bad, but you're able to take that and, and apply it to your own work. Yes, yes. I mean, I used to study Mark Farmer's stuff. Oh, good. I, I, yeah, I yeah, loved his stuff. Yeah. Um, but, and one time I was working on um, She Hulk, and the editor said, uh, please give her burn hair after John Byrne. Right. I, I copied that sucker just perfect. <laughs> but so who was the penciler? Do you remember? Yeah, John Statima. Oh, John Statima. Okay, yeah. 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 He's he's not a John Byrne lookalike at all, though, is he? No. So I had <laughs> I had to compensate. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Cassisi says it's mastery. Um Royal Airship says a femme fatale forger art art thief. <laughs> There's a storyline in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Could be. <laughs> so um so okay let's, let's circle back to your first work okay uh, you you landed it in san diego as a result of going to san diego i landed it with chris Alm. chris Alm, and what did chris Alm give you and for those of you who don't know chris Alm was the uh, was the editor-in-chief of malibu comics and my boss the, for several years at the time he was doing eternity comics mm -hmm. and he hired me actually to do gray washes okay um and not inks. I, he wanted me so gray to wash do only. Gray wash only, and he so. wanted me to do that on Tiger X. Okay, been done. Yes. Yeah. So, so was the book already inked, and you just added gray yeah. wash? Okay. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And That's he says, uh, "Well, can you do gray washes?" And I'm saying, "Oh, absolutely! Yeah, <laughs> piece of cake." I didn't have the first clue what the hell gray washes were, <laughs> but I lied through my teeth <laughs> because I'm a quick learner. So I got off the plane and I first stop I made was the library and I checked out every book I could on watercolor. Now I'm I'm an acrylic painter. I'm not a watercolorist. So I taught myself watercoloring by the time the pages arrived, I knew what I was doing. That's funny. So I That's did two funny. yeah, I did two issues of Tiger X. And then he says, Well, uh, how about um, three issues of Jack the Ripper? You can do uh, the inks and the gray washes, and that's probably the most horrid piece of work I've ever done. <laughs> I can't even look at them. I think I own those. <laughs> oh, they're bad. I'm pretty oh, sure I have. So do, do you know, was Tiger X collected into a bound volume? Yeah, I think so. I've got that then. <laughs> yeah. I've got to go pull that out and look at it again. That's your very first work. Interesting. As, uh, as an anchor, yeah. So... Um, so where, where did, how, how did this, where did this go? How did this get you more stuff? Well, the next thing that I was this, offered was. This would have been was, roughly, what, 87, 88? Yeah, 88 by this okay. time because the, the it came out in print in 89. So I was working in 88 because you work several months ahead of. Um, and the next work, thing I was offered, believe it or not, after those two horrible books um, <laughs> was um, Planet of the Apes for Adventure really? Comics. Wow. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And I worked 11 issues over Kent Burles, um, Planet mm -hmm. of the Apes. And um, Charles Marshall really, was the writer for those. Charles Marshall. Yeah. And that was a real, a real learning experience because, um, I mean, I consistently had to do uh, pages every day. And there was like 28 pages in those issues. They were yeah. more than 24. Wow. And I got my first paycheck for an entire issue. Inked 28 pages was $400. <laughs> I remember those days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. And after I finished that, I thought I was on top of the world. I yeah. thought I was all that and a bag of chips. So I packed everything <laughs> up and I went out to New York. Okay. It, wow. Yep. I was going to make the tour, the tour of the DC and Marvel offices because I 
I was, I had arrived. <laughs> you know? Wow. <laughs> I was a little precocious now, there. Now, did, I? did you go to New York then? I did. I went out there for 10 days. Really? I did. I wow. stayed again. I stayed with Barry Blair. Um, sure. He had a an super apartment. nice guy. He had an apartment on uh, Broadway and 42nd street, a uh, tiny little uh, closet like apartment that his rent cost more than my entire house payment. Oh, it was terrible. Yeah. So I made yeah. the, I, I made the, the tour of the, of the offices. I don't remember the one at Marvel that much, but I remember the one at DC very much because um, this is kind of a famous story at this point, but uh, I took my samples in there and the editor looked them over. Uh, I won't reveal his name. Yep. Um, Some of them don't need to be mentioned. Yeah. <laughs> and he was flipping through my samples for Planet of the Apes, and he says, "This is this is really really good. You are you're a really good inker. You ink like a man." Oh. <laughs> oh no. Of course, the first thing that might comes to my mind, he looking like a man. <laughs> the Saturday Night Live skit, right? Oh my goodness. And and so, I mean, how did you react to that? Well, I was kind of flabbergasted, and he says, "You know." We don't do monkeys very often here at DC, <laughs> yeah. but if we ever do, I'll think of you. And I thought, okay, I'm the monkey woman now. <laughs> so, and and then like a few months later, Gorilla Joe came out from DC and like, well, he didn't think about me. No did he? <laughs> way, no way. <laughs> oh, that's funny. But that was okay because Malibu hired me then to do yeah. um, to work on uh, the Ultra Group. Yeah. Or ultraverse yeah. books. Yeah. Ho no, no one there ever said you you ink like a man, did they? No. I okay. was treated with absolute <laughs> respect from the guys at Malibu. They were so great to work for. Good. Good. I'm glad to hear that. Um, Cassisi says, uh, as a writer, I know visual writing is important. Could you describe the best writing style that you were able to really bring to life with that, that art? And then to, to describe the mistake made in the worst experience that you inked. So, so let, let me, let, I, this two, that's a two-parter here. Can you describe the best writing style that you were able to really bring to life with the art? Um, well, since the, pen, so I, the pages already arrived to me, already penciled, so that vision had already been realized by the penciler, and it was up to me to interpret. I usually didn't have the script. Yeah. Sometimes I did, but there, most of the time, I never saw a script. Right. Yeah, and that's not unusual for an inker. Um, but but I, I I recall that um, from from Cat and Mouse, you asked me for the script. You said, "Hey, can I have the script for this?" And of course, I'm like, "Yeah, sure, you you, you can have it." But um, but it wasn't my natural thought to send you um, the script because, as you mentioned, the pencil is the one who pencils from the script. Right, and the re I will ask for a script if I am unsure what the penciler is telling me or what time of day it's supposed yeah. to be. That's a huge one is like the pencils won't tell me where the lights, you know, what time of day is it night? Right. Is it because they're, they are um, counting on the colorist to do the work for them. Yeah. So yeah. I will ask for the script in that, in those cases where I'm unsure what's, what's going on in the scene, but most of the time I don't need it. Yeah. So then the the um, so then the second part of the question. No apologies, because you see, this is a uh, it's, it's this is uh, it's what right. we, we yeah that's why we ask the, the questions and it's all about learning, right? Because right. uh, see, I gotta I gotta confess to you, man. I I, I was I, I've I've been very good, but I still want to show them the pages you sent me. I haven't done it. I haven't done it because I gave you my words are just for me. But I wanted to show my my you know my team. Like look look, this is one of my students. Uh, so the second part of his his question is. Um, Describe the mistake made in the worst in the worst experience that you've inked. So, my worst mistake. Yes, uh, <laughs> I honestly can't think of. I mean, I, I I can look back on stuff now and going, ooh, that wasn't so good. But um, probably. Probably I, uh, there is one issue that I mistook the uh, guy's uh, edge of his leg was actually the cape. 
<laughs> and so when I looked at it later, I, I, I was just inking along, you know, and I, and after it was already sent off and, and, and published and everything, I'm like, what is up with that guy's leg? <laughs> Holy cow, it looks wrong. And then I realized, oh my God, it was supposed to be a cape there, not his leg. So yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, okay. See, he he actually says maybe a strong learning point. Is there is there some some point where like the the the, the cape thing? Is there some point where you did something, and then later on you look back at, and and it was a fantastic learning experience for you? Maybe not positive, maybe not, or maybe positive, maybe negative, but it was a learning experience for you. Oh, I can't think of it. I I I don't. You you don't see hardly any mistakes on my pages. I'm there. I've used. I've been using the same piece of what, bottle of white out for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> white out. Yeah. Yeah. And of course, if you, you're, I know you've shifted to doing some things digitally now. And if you do digitally, it's just like undo, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's a nice, I don't have to think about it. I, I have a tendency to overthink my pages. I will sit there and study them for quite a while before I tackle them. Yeah. Um, I will ponder the, the pages and look at them and I'll turn them this way and I'll turn them that way. And um, it used to be back when I was working on the original pages, the pencils, I would start in the far, uh, the lower right hand corner and work my way diagonally across the page up to the far upper left hand corner, which is exactly opposite of what. Yeah, Cause you're right handed, aren't you? Yes. Yeah. So you're going over all of your inks as you ink. Um, yes, but I'm not smudging the pencils. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, okay. So I always had two or three pages going at once. So I'd ink a little bit on this page. I'd set it aside, and I'd bring the other page, and I would work on three pages, um, usually three pages at once. Wow. Um, and I worked from the far corner down in the bottom to the top because I didn't want to uh, lay my hand over the, the pencil pages. I didn't want to lose anything. I, I was afraid I was going to smudge them. Huh. Interesting. Uh, Cassisi said, thanks for that, Barb. He appreciates it. Um, so I want to ask you now, uh, before we kind of move a little, because I do kind of want to talk about your, your, your tools and moving into digital. Um, who were some of your early inspirations? Like, like who did you look at? And as you were, you know, you said you spent that year uh, training and learning. Who were you looking at? Who did you say, that's who I, I want to get a line like that, or this inker, or that inker, and that inker. Who were some of your inspirations? Wally Wood, for one. Oh, wow. That's a great one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Mark Farmer is another one. Um, uh, oh, gosh. Now you're going to make me think, and I can't think. Um, just, I mean, a lot of the old classics. I I, uh, I, I had a Bernie Wrightson's uh, Frankenstein book that I. Oh, that's I, a great one. Yeah, I would study that one a lot. Um, Senate, Joe Senate. Sure. You know, yeah. Um, you know, just lost. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. Some mostly the classics that everybody always looks at. Uh, I, I, I studied Wendy's work because it, she was huge in the brush and, um, that's, was my medium with brushes. Yeah. I really never got into pens much. I did some pens, especially if an editor said, you know, can you give it the, the image look, you know, I'd yeah. break out the quill. You know, the, the pro quill, the, but uh, the mostly scratchy. I stuck with the, the scratchy, scratchy stuff. Yeah, the scratchy, scratchy. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure if Tommy wasn't muted, he would be he would be uh, echoing that uh, that sentiment as well. Um, now, okay, since since we're mentioning Tommy real quick, so as we watch Tommy kind of ink, do you, is there a, do you ever see an inker do something? You're like, well, why did he do that, or why did she do that, or <laughs> why is he making this circle there? What uh, <laughs> do, you, do you ever see them doing things and question? Well, that's an interesting way to do it. I may have to try that, or or why is that inker doing things that way? Yeah, there's there's been several instances where I will look at an anchor. I'm like, how the hell did he get that effect? <laughs> okay. And um, I've never actually questioned. Well, there have, haven't been many instances where I've I've looked at somebody and said, why did he do that? Unless it's like a multitude of lines that make no sense at all, where uh, 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What the heck do those lines mean? Yeah, you're just throwing <laughs> lines in there. Oh, now. <laughs> you're just throwing yeah. lines in there just to throw lines in there. And especially, I, I really, really um, dislike seeing a bunch of scritchy lines on women's faces because they, yeah. they look like old hags. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but and there's a real popular, but well, not just the scratchy scratchy on the women's, but, but the scratchy scratchy and lines for no apparent reason was real popular in the, in the early nineties, particularly with the image stuff. It drew, it, it drove me crazy. I like <laughs> a, a cleaner look. Yeah. Um, but there's been many times when I've looked at, um, somebody's pages and wondered how they got that effect. So then I'll have to like print it out or something like that and stare at it and try to figure out, well, how did they do that? And then I'll try various methods to see if I could reproduce those looks. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I'm successful. Sometimes I'm not. You know, it's a lot, there's a lot of anchors that have such a, a definite um, specific style that they've developed that it's, it, you, can't, you can't imitate it. Yeah. Yeah. And some of, of course, it comes, you know, from trial and error, right? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, um. So that was, that was a question about a big blob there, a question about inspiration. Um, what about to, today? Do you, do you have favorite inkers that are working today? Do you, do you, are there any that you're like, okay, if this inker is on this book, I'm going to buy the book kind of regardless of, of whatever else it is. Um, I've been kind of out of touch with comics uh, in the last few years. And I've, well, after I got back in, I've, um, I've been so, so focused on, Making them? Yeah, making them that I haven't really had a chance to see the new inkers out there. There's books that I collect. Um, um, I've always been a, a fan of um, uh, Terry Moore. Oh, yeah. Strangers in Paradise. Yeah. yeah, I think he's got a beautiful style. And the way he does hair is awesome. I love yep. it. Um, and I've been collecting anything Avengers or, or, or Iron Man related. And gotcha. some of the, yeah. <laughs> but I, I've kind gee, of gee, fallen, why? I know, I know. <laughs> but I've kind of fallen out with uh, learning the new crop of of artists. I, yeah. I knew everybody in the '90s. I knew everybody, and and um, I've just kind of fallen out of the loop as to yeah. who's coming in. I'm starting to learn the names again, but uh, I'm a little slow. And and another thing is, I have a horrible horrible memory. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, I don't know if it's age or what, but I'll look at somebody and, I, and then five minutes later, I'll forget their name. So you'll have to, you'll have to forgive me for that. Yeah, I can, I can think of, you know, I can think of people, I can see the artwork in my head, but I'm like, oh, who is that again? Ah, oh, I can't remember. You can remember the page, but not the name. Oh yeah, I can remember the yeah. artwork like, yeah. like you wouldn't believe. I can't remember who did it. I think Tommy said he has that same problem as well. Uh, <laughs> There you go. Uh, Hyper Potato BOF says, been a fan of Barb for years, maybe since uh, Adventures with Kent Burles, trying to remember. Uh, I would think he means Adventure Comics, the Planet of the Apes stuff. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so yeah, Hyper Potato, you've, uh, you've probably been following Barb since almost the very beginning. Um, yeah, which is a very, uh, very cool style. Barb, you were talking just before we started. Um, you had worked, I think you said, I forget what year you said it was, but you'd worked with like seven different publishers that year. 1993. I was working for seven companies at the same time, which is insane. I mean, uh, I had gotten, I'm a very, very regimented worker when I want to be, um, when my paycheck depends on it. Not yeah. so much these days when it's, when I'm retired and I can make my own hours. But when I was putting a roof over my kid's head and, our livelihood depended on my inking. I could, I would get up early in the morning and uh, do the kid thing. And then I would ink for 12 to 16 hours every day. I did that seven days a week for 12 years and I wow. never missed a single deadline. So I was churning out books right and left. And um, because I was such a workhorse and I was so dependable, I got a lot of work. Yeah. So yeah. I was working for, in 1993, I was working for, DC, Marvel, Warp Graphics, Palliard Press, Now Comics, Innovation Comics, and Malibu Comics. Wow. At the same time. Now I don't know. I knew all but the one, Palliard. I don't know. I don't know who that is. That they. Um, 
<laughs> going to make me think. Um, Sorry, I put you Bucado, on the Bucado, space, uh, zap gum for hire. Phil Folio. Oh, oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Phil Folio. Yeah. Yeah. I did. I did a lot of those. Um, he and he did the work slow enough so that it only, it only came in, you know, one once or twice a year. And I had quoted him a page rate when I first started doing those in '92 or '93. And we didn't end the project until in the late '90s. And by that time. My page rate was like four times the going <laughs> the rate I had quoted him, but I quoted him a price and I yep. stuck to it, even though DC and Marvel were paying me uh, really, really, really good money. Yeah. Uh, wow. So yeah, I mean, I can confirm um, that certainly your name around the offices was always you know gold. Uh, you know, Barb's doing this, Barb's doing that, and, and it probably doesn't surprise you that. Um, Editors get kind of territorial, you know, no, 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 this is my inker. You can't have her. <laughs> I've got these projects. And if she gets on your projects, then she won't be doing my projects. And, you know, and I think that's part of the reason that the companies came up with uh, rate sheets uh, because they didn't want their, you know, editors bidding against each other for, for, uh, really? for yeah. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. We had a, we had a rate sheet. In fact, when Marvel bought us, uh, we got access to the Marvel rate sheets because um, they didn't want us doing the same thing with Marvel talent. They're like, yeah, we don't want you calling them and saying, you know, what's Marvel paying you? We'll pay you $10 more, $20 more, something like that, a page. Uh, Interesting. Yep. So it was, you know, hey, we'll offer you your Marvel rate or, or whatever so that they have to make the choice. Well, I knew that um, I knew that, that editors had their own stables of talent that they liked to, have to hold yeah. on to. And that's one of the reasons that, that uh, when everything imploded, at the end of the century, yeah. um, I kind of lost my jobs because my editors went away and the new editors brought in their own stables and yeah, and I was kind of burnt. At it's a, it. it's a frustrating thing, but, um, you know, uh, when you take that step back and, and, and uh, remove the emotions involved with it, which is hard to do, right? You, you understand, okay, these editors are bringing in people that they know and have worked with and trust and can rely on. And it's just easier to do that than to say, I don't know you, even though I know you worked on this project before, I don't know you. So see you later. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, and like I said, I, I got a really good reputation in the industry uh, during the nineties. I was turning out two pages a day and I was doing that seven days a week. Plus I was doing covers and trading cards and I love doing trading cards. Yeah. Cause those were insanely Price they paid so so even better than my page rate. That's what I've heard. And it, for one little five by seven piece, it was like yes, I'll do all of this. I'll do the whole stack. Yeah, I've heard that from just about any artist that I've ever talked to about trading cards, and I'm like, really? Yeah. But apparently that there's a there's quite the budget for those. Yes. Um, nice. Yeah. So um, so. Seven seven different publishers in in ninety three, which is certainly a very big uh, year for Malibu because that's the year Malibu launched the Ultraverse. Uh, mm -hmm. Yep, so there were a whole lot of titles. Um, what are, what are some of the? And I'm asking this just because for me because I was at the Ultraverse. So what Ultraverse titles can you remember working on? Uh, Strangers, Mantra, of course, Solitaire. I did every issue of Solitaire. And that was over um, Jeff Johnson. Jeff Johnson. Right? Yeah, that was. And I'm, I'm looking here and I'm trying to see the solution. There he goes. There's okay. another one. Yep. Um, I'm not that's solitaire. I can't remember all of all of the ones that I did. I think that was. Oh, and I did. Uh, I did one uh, crossover with when Malibu and Marvel had their. Oh, yeah. Their, I did the Avengers with uh, George Perez. Oh, nice, yeah. sweet! No, yeah, that was a good. My book. only adventures book. Oh. <laughs> yeah, the whole long story about uh, the characters and what what should have come to Malibu that didn't, but still, it was it was fun for the things that we got to do. What with Loki and um, the Black Knight being part of of mm -hmm. uh, Ultra Force. Um, so a after that, you did eventually end up at uh, at DC and, and mm -hmm. Marvel doing some stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, Marvel was a little disappointing. I mean, I love Marvel. I'm, I'm a Marvel gal, even though I love DC, too. Um, 
but I had a very hard time getting anything out of Marvel that wasn't female related. Do you think if your name had been Bob Kalberg, it might have been? Uh... Mm, could be. <laughs> very mal DC oh. gave me all superheroes. Malibu gave me superheroes. It didn't matter. But Marvel, I, I got a lot of Barbie. And I actually inked Amanda Connor on yeah. Barbie because that's what she who's, could get at the beginning. Yeah, who's a big name today. I know. Yeah. Um, uh, and I did a lot of Barbie. I did some Disney. Um, I did uh, an issue of uh, Captain Marvel, a little She-Hulk. But you see, you, you get a theme here. Going, yeah, I do. Know? I yeah. absolutely do. And, and you know, uh, you and I have talked about this probably a little bit on stream, but a lot off stream. I don't get that. That's not something that 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 I I understand because it's just not really part of my lexicon. You know, mm -hmm. uh, what I understand is styles. And if someone says, "Oh, I like your style," and we have this style on Barbie, but I also have that style on on Quasar. You know, mm -hmm. <laughs> and so. I added both books. Which one do you want to do? You know, um, yeah. And there, there was a long time, many, many years. I was kind of bitter about just being stuck with Barbie, and, and I, I did a lot of Barbie, um, and and I was kind of bitter about that until a few years ago. I started doing conventions again, and I had a lot of um, free comp copies of Barbie. Yeah. And um, there were there were guys bringing their little girls. To these yeah. conventions and they went crazy for these Barbie books and I got to thinking you know in a lot of cases those Barbie books were the first introduction that these little girls had to comics the comics yeah yeah so that kind of made it all better yeah you know? good good well yeah and, and you know uh, my daughter when she was young was a huge Barbie nut uh, wasn't something that we pushed as her parents. She just gravitated towards it and she loved everything Barbie, uh, you know, which, you know, includes the, the, the comic books. So uh, I would have to go back and look because in all honesty, I didn't pay that much attention to them. Um, but you know, it's quite possible. She had, uh, she had some of the ones that, that, that you ate. Probably. Um, she was born in 95. So that, that would have put her maybe a little bit young, um, for uh for comic reading at the time mm -hmm. but uh but you know anyone who's watched me any number of times know that i love shop shopping in the, the quarter boxes so <laughs> so uh no telling what i picked up from there um now dc was a whole different story i believe the first thing i did for dc uh, was hawkman i'm not sure if that came first or if primal force came first Primal Force was really interesting. I spent uh, 17 issues on that. Every issue that they had before it was canceled, I was on every single one. It was a really? brand new, Primal yeah. Force? Wow. Mm -hmm. It was. Yeah. I it think was, I had a bunch of the issues. It was a brand new book. I actually was flown out to New York for that. So was uh, Ken Hooper, the penciler, and Steve okay. Siegel, the, the writer. And we had this uh, creative meeting on that. And. Um, they brought some obscure characters. There was um, Red Tornado, Golem, Claw, uh, Jack-O-Lantern, and a new character that had never been seen before, and that was Meridian. That was the girl. And so they were doing character sketches, and Ken Hooper just used me as the model for Meridian. So, uh, Oh, cool. Yeah, so I, I was actually Meridian wow. uh, in Primal Force. I have to go back and uh, look and see if I still have those. And um, so we did that, and I did all 17 issues. Eventually, Ken was too far behind, and so they brought some guest pencilers on to finish off the series. Jim Hall was one. Oh, sure, uh, Jim. Yeah, I loved working on him. Yeah. He's very good. Yeah. Um, you know, I've tried to talk him into doing some Silverline stuff with us. Oh, I, oh, I would yeah. love to work with him again. Yeah, maybe I'll tell him that and see if that helps at all. Um, I did a show with him a few years back, and I asked him what else, you know, if, if I approached him at the time. This probably goes back to around the time of Cat and Mouse 1. And he, his, his, he just said, you know, I'm just playing golf these days. Okay, I guess so. <laughs> I'm sitting on my patio half the morning, so, know, you know. Yeah. Yep. I do this for fun. Um, I was also working for, you know, I, I wasn't exclusive to DC, even though 
later on I had a contract with them. Uh, I wasn't exclusive. They never made me stick to just them. So I was also working for Now Comics at the time and, and Innovation. So um, what, are some, what are some of the titles you did for, for those? I did Green Hornet. Oh, for with, Now uh, Comics. Um, Who was Penciler? Do you remember? Was that? No, uh, I don't. That was Pelletier, I think. Paul Pelletier? I think he did one of those. Uh, Tuma, okay. Paul Tuma uh, did some of those too. Sure, okay. Um, I also did Married with Children. Sure, I remember that book. Wow. Uh, Speed Racer. Go Speed Racer. Yeah. You know, now, now, don't forget, I've done over 200 titles, so I'm not going to remember yeah. everything uh, at this <laughs> well, late I just, date. Just I just asked you to remember the highlights. Yeah. And for innovation, <laughs> for innovation, I did uh, a lot of the movie adaptations. I did uh, Freddy's Dead and Child's okay. Play, uh, Lost in Space, and I actually worked with uh, Bill Mooney and Miguel Ferrer on that. Nice. Yeah. And... Yeah. Um, uh, and what most people don't realize is that uh, Innovation got the rights to do the Stephen King movie adaptation of Lawnmower Man. Mm. And uh, they had Stuart and Monin pencil that. It was mm -hmm. a 60-page graphic novel, Stuart and Monin pencils, which were beautiful. Oh, my God, they were so gorgeous. I inked it. It was fully colored, ready to go to press, and Stephen King killed it. Oh, brought no. his lawyers on board, and they killed it before it went to press. I, we still we all got paid for it, so I mean, props to innovation for that. Um, but somewhere or other, David Campetti has got these beautiful pages stuffed away. Uh, oh man, that are never going to see the light of day. You know, Stuart, Stuart Amonin's beautiful work. Isn't it depressing that that? And we could probably go out and run, uh, t tick off a little list of things uh, of projects that 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 were finished but we'll never see the light of day for for various reasons most of them stupid uh yeah, yeah that, that's that's unfortunate uh Wubba says i'm with you on the on the uh, quarter bins rolling uh you find some good stuff in those i absolutely 100 agree lots of gems in those uh hyper potato said jim who i didn't understand the last name jim hall h-a-l-l -L. uh jim also did uh for me he did um uh, the, some protectors at the at the very end of the run. So, um, yeah, super super talented guy who I really wish would uh, would draw some more draw some more comics. Um, so so the the Marvel and DC stuff was that mostly happening about the same time, or or were you yeah. kind that's, of most? That's pretty much. Um, those were my two mainstays for a long time. DC actually threw me more work than Marvel. Okay. Um, because I I ended up working on long. Uh, period projects for them. I spent two and a half years on Impulse for them. Uh, okay. I spent two years on Craig Rousseau and Bill Messner Loeb's was the writer. Wow. Okay. Um, I was actually under contract to DC at, at the time, but it wasn't exclusive. I was allowed to work for other companies. Well, so so let's talk because I know there are a lot of people who um, who if they don't watch live, they'll watch the the replays. When you say under contract, and I'm not asking for the this was specifics, but when you're under contract at DC, what is what does that mean? What does that entail? Well, for one thing, it gave me health insurance. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so health insurance. Which That's is great. It means yeah. I contracted to do a specific number of issues for a specific book. Okay. And I, I had to honor those. You know, I couldn't back out and say, oh, I got another um, offer from so-and-so. I'm going to back off the book. Right. You know, I couldn't leave the book. So okay. that's basically what it meant. It meant I could, it, I wasn't under ins exclusive, so I could work for other people, but I had to finish this book, which I had no problem with. I loved working on that book. Impulse was a great gig. Yeah. And after I left it, uh, after the two years was up, uh, they they brought on Ethan Van Skyver to be mm -hmm. the new penciler and, and the new, a new team. And uh, his inker got behind, so I ended up, doing another six months or another six issues of impulse over Ethan. <laughs> uh, so I ended up actually doing two and a half years of wow. impulse. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, well, I, I want to go back to, uh, I, I forget the title you said it was, uh, Ken Hooper was doing. Primal force. Primal force. So, um, so you said they, they, they brought in fill an artist cause, uh, cause, Ken wasn't able to, to keep the pace. Uh, did they ask you to do the fill-in uh, pencilers as well, or did they just not ask you to work on those? 
Oh no, I did. I did all every issue. Oh, okay. Over all the pencilers. Okay, so they didn't skip you. Nope. While while skipping uh, a Ken. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um. So so I know that this is going to be a difficult question to answer, but I'm going to uh, ask it anyway. <laughs> um. When you look at your when you look at your body of work, and what I will do, as I will say, except for 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 the newest stuff, Cat and Mouse and Divinity, okay. Mm -hmm. um, when you look at your body of work, what would you say has been? Uh, what would you say has been was your favorite book? And maybe what do you look at with the most pride and say, "I'm so glad that I was able to do that." Oh yeah, that is a difficult question. I could probably <laughs> give you two or three answers. Okay, that's fine. Each one of us. Um, Jeff Johnson and I made an absolutely kick-ass team on Salatire. I was proud to to do every issue of that. Um, yeah. I was I was proud to do every single issue of Primal Force, especially since I was I was one of the characters um, uh, or the model for one of the characters. Yeah, uh, and so I, I I did the entire run of that, and I I was really glad that I did. Um, I was proud to be on impulse for that. I mean, a lot of people, a lot of artists don't get the chance to spend two plus years on a right. book. Especially that's, today. Yeah, that's a, a, a real notch in my belt um, for that. Um, but mostly I was just proud uh, that I had a good reputation. Yeah. You know, I really worked hard to maintain that reputation as, as a good workhorse. I wouldn't say that I'm the best inker in the world by far. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of other anchors out there that I look at and I'm like, oh my God, I don't even know why I bother trying. <laughs> you know, why did but, I get up this morning, right? <laughs> but I had a good reputation. Um, I had a, 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 a great reputation as a professional. I met my deadlines. I was uh, consistently professional in my in my um, on my dealings, and that's a matter of pride. Yeah. Yeah. Well, so so because you said this, so I, I'm going to ask you maybe to uh, uh, confirm or deny it. Uh, one of the things that I, I, I tell my students, of course, now keep in mind, I, I do teach writing students and not art students. Uh, but one of the things that I, that I tell my students is, it, you know, it's not always how good you are at the writing itself. It's can you meet the deadlines? You have to be able to meet the deadlines. And if you're OK a lot of times you're going to get hired as the okay guy rather than the, than the, the, than the person who's like, wow, this is a great person. Well, they're great, but they can never meet a deadline. So. And I've had lots of pencilers like that. Yeah. But, um, but what happens. It, your professional it, I mean, reputation yeah. is everything. Yeah. Would it's you everything. Would you say that, would, would you, would you say it's fair to say that you have gotten jobs simply because the editors know you can meet the deadlines? Oh, absolutely. I was, I was filling anchors on so many projects because the project got behind or, you know, the other anchor, was, the usual anchor wasn't available or doing something else or had a family emergency. Give Barb a call. Yeah. Cause she'll, yeah. she'll make the deadline. She'll get the job done. Yeah. You know, I got a lot of work that way. Yeah. <laughs> it's well, not a bad way to get it. No, not at all. I, and and I, th I think that's important for, for young artists to, to keep in mind is that, um, you know, I, I hear so, and uh, Barbara, you probably heard it too. I hear so much while well, I'm working on these pages, but I've been working on this page for a week now. <laughs> and my thought is like, well, what the heck are you going to do with that one page that you've been working on for a week? In a week's time, you should have done, in my thinking, minimum three, three pages, right? What the heck? Um, yeah, so... Um, yeah, I, I'm glad to hear you confirm that. And I don't know, I don't know how many of my current students are, are listening. Probably not any, but uh, it's something I, I definitely talk about in my. And it makes some students mad because I I am such a stickler for the deadlines. Yes, I, I think it's huge. And I had I had one penciler that um, I was working with, and I won't name names. <laughs> not like that. I don't like to throw anybody under the bus. No, I'm going to ask you favorite ones here in a minute. <laughs> um. And, and, and he was penciling a, a series that I was working on and uh, the, the, the issue just got later and later and later. And, and finally I called him up and I said, where's my pages? And he's like, oh, you know, I just haven't been able to feel the art. Oh no. 
this is a business. I mean, yes, we're all artists, but it's also our reputation is also our business. Yep. It's also our livelihood. So, you know, just get to the drawing board and uh, do your job. Oh, that's nuts. Um, Ovin, I see your question. I'm going to hang on to your question for, uh, for just a little bit. Um, but Barbara, while we're talking about pencilers, who have been some of your, um, so I'm not going to ask you the ones that you didn't want to work on. Okay. Or don't want to work on. Let's talk about the ones that, that you absolutely enjoyed who have been, been some of your favorite pencilers to where you've already mentioned Jeff Johnson. Yep. So who, who have been some of your favorite pencilers to work on? Um, Howard Porter. Okay, cool. Ivan Reese, Dean Zachary, Ken Hooper, um, Jim Paul. Okay. Wow. Uh, Amanda Connor. <laughs> you know, Craig Rousseau. Wow. Um, I could, oh gosh, I could go on and make a huge long list, but I, I can't, I'm blanking. Bunch of, cool, the, a bunch of cool pencilers there. Yeah. I've, well, like I said, I've done like 200 books, so I kind of forget everybody at some point. Uh, um, I'm yeah, blanking, I'm blanking. Sorry. Oh, That's John okay. Sadama. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now it is kind of interesting because he does have a, a bit of a different kind of style than the, than the real smooth. Yeah. Very yeah. tight, yeah. very detailed. So yeah, I, I actually like tight and detail. Um, people will say, well, isn't it just tracing? It's like, no, <laughs> not really, no. but I'm a very anal kind of person. I, I suppose uh, you could correlate that because uh, in my other real life job i'm a, an accountant which is a very anal type of work <laughs> yeah. and and i like i like type pencils so um yeah. i that's very anal as well and and you, if you would have seen some of the pages that um, i worked on on ethan van skyver before he started inking his own stuff they were insane and so was john statima yeah yeah. Now I don't. I don't think I've seen Van Skyver's uh, pencils, but I've seen Stadimus obviously, because mm -hmm. uh, he did some stuff for uh, for Malibu. Rags Morales is another one. Cool. Yeah. I Those are some good pencils, uh, pencilers. Um, so I'm gonna, I, I, I uh, I'm going to ask this question. Uh, I'm not sure uh, that we're going to give you the answer you want because that's a really loaded question. I'm going to ask it. Uh, Bard, but it is kind of a loaded question, and we love you, Oven. But um, but you're 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 setting us up here almost. <laughs> so so uh, Oven says the question is for both of you. He says, which Silverline book has your favorite style of art? <laughs> anything I'm working on. <laughs> yeah, that, yeah, that's a great answer. Any, anything that you're working on. Um, yeah, I, I think um, for for me, Oven, I, I think that I, I like. I love comics, okay, and so I like all different styles of art. I like. Um, uh, I'm not a big manga fan, so I don't like the the manga. Has, for me, uh, and I know people always say, "Yeah, but what about this artist?" And I'm, okay, so I know there are exceptions out there. Uh, manga tends to be a little too simplistic. Um, not cartoony. I don't like cartoony. I like cartoony. Um, but it's well, I, simplistic and there doesn't seem to be a lot there. And I know, I know it is what it is for, for what it is, but I like all kinds of styles. Um, so, you know, my concern for the Silverline books obviously is, do we, do we get the right style of art on the, on the right project? And, you know, I mean, I, I, obviously I would be lying if I didn't say, I think we've been able to pull that off for, uh, for the Silverline titles. Um, so I just think that, you know, story helps, uh, story help determine the kind of style of art. I have a tendency to lean towards a more realistic type penciling. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't particularly, and I've done it because I mean, you're a freelancer, you get hired to do stuff. You do yeah. it. Um, yeah. uh, I did, I did, um, the mask for, for now sure. comics, yeah. which was very highly caricaturized, right. You know, very exaggerated, you know, expressions and, and very, very cartoony and over exaggerated caricatures. I don't, I don't tend to like that type of style. I'll do it. I mean, right. It's easy. Yeah. Um, but I, if I had, if I can pick, I prefer a more realistic looking style. Yeah. I think my, my, my first, 
the the first time I really kind of liked something that wasn't sort of the realistic thing, like a, a Perez or something like that, who's one of my favorites. Um, I can't remember the t- name of the book, but do you remember uh, an art by the uh, artist by the name of Trent Carey Canuga or something like this? No. Uh, shoot. Uh, Tommy probably remembers. Uh, what was his name? Trent Canuga. He did a he did an independent book in the nineties. Uh, Canuga maybe. Um, oh, says he's worked. Uh, where's the comics? Uh, says he's worked on a bunch of games, but that's not what I'm I'm looking for. He, well, I don't want to I don't want to stick on him. It's not about it's not about him. Um, I'm trying to remember the name of the book that he did. Oh, it's called Creed. Um, and he's got a very uh, sort of manga influenced, uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, along the lines of a Ringo style, uh, mm-hmm. something like that. You know, kind of a car. Really, it's kind of well, the way I look at it. It's kind of uh, it's American art influenced by manga. Uh, Hyper Potato, you got it right. Yeah, Trent uh, Trent Kaniuga of uh, of Creed. Um, that was really the first one I saw that I went, wow, I really like the look of this. Um, but I also, for me, I, I do think it has to be, um, uh, it has to kind of fit the project. Um, I don't, I don't think that I would like that style on, on say a project like, you know, cat and mouse, which is, um, uh, more which, gritty. Yeah. More of a gritty thing. Um, yeah. Uh, wubba has got a question for you. He says, um, says, do you prefer a heavy handed penciler laying dark lines or a soft touch penciler? Um, I've worked with both. Uh, when I was, all right, let's, let's break this down into two parts. Uh, when I was working on original pages, mm. uh, I did not like the heavy hand. Did not like it at all because my ink wouldn't stick to the graphite. So the soft touch worked better in that respect because uh, if you laid the ink on the, like, especially in the large dark area, black areas, uh, and then you went and erased it later, <laughs> the ink would slide right off the graphite. Yeah. It, it, it sucked big time. Um, but then, would you have to kind of come back and touch that up with ink? Yeah. And then yeah. I, and then, well, my husband was my my uh, blacker. And he would come in and, and touch them back up. But now it's flipped because now I get all of my pages electronically, and I print them out on blue lines. And if you use a really soft touch now, those blue lines fade right out. I prefer a heavy-handed approach now because the blue lines will show up much much clearer and crisper than the soft feathery um, gentle touch, which I'll, I'll lose a lot of lines that way. If yeah. you, you turn it into blue lines and then print it out with a printer, um, some of them don't print. Heck yeah. Yeah. So uh, that's a good question. And, and uh, now I'm not asking for, um, I'm not asking for pencil or names here, but um, can you think of any, any times that you've worked on a project that the penciler, has um, has been unhappy with your work or reached out and said, you know, you're doing this wrong or I want you to do this or, or again, no names, not, not asking, to, we're not trying to point negative names at, but what I'm looking for is, is um, how did you react to, to those kind of instances? Uh, what did you do in your own work? Because as you've mentioned multiple times, and I, I 100% agree with you, you're professional and you, and you have to, 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 to take these things in stride. But how do you react to those and how do you handle those? And then how does that affect your work? Uh, I try to be very objective and, and see where the penciler is coming from. It hasn't really happened very often. Maybe That's good. Maybe only three or four times in my entire career has, has a, a penciler wanted me to adjust something I was doing. Wow. Um, I had, I, I had one penciler that didn't like the way I did faces. Mm-hmm. So, um, and it would, it was a consistent complaint. So I finally just said, why don't you ink the faces yourself and then I'll take it from there. <laughs> and, so, and it worked. 
so would would it uh, would it have been fair? Do you think um, in, in a situation like this, uh, is it fair for the for the inker to say, you know, hey, um, why don't you pencil this a little tighter so I have a, a better idea of what you want? Yeah, you it's have, absolutely yeah. that is absolutely a reasonable because if you can't if you can't tell what they're trying to do in a in a like what the hell is this is this <laughs> yeah. what is this glob here right is this supposed to be somebody's hand is it supposed to be their pouch on their leg i'm not quite picking up what they're putting down so yeah it's absolutely within um your right to ask them to either tighten up um their pencils or ask them what are you getting at here on this page yeah. um, panel number three what is that blob? Right. You know, <laughs> and I've done that plenty of times. Yeah. I, I, I've done that lots of times, actually. I, I will um, contact a penciler and say, what is this thing here in the corner? Yeah. And, you know, I'll, I'll be happy to ink it. You just got to let me know what it is. <laughs> yeah. <You know>? <laughs> Uh, Tommy says, yup. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, so that's kind of, that, that, that's an interesting question. Um, because you know, it, you got your start in the late eighties when we didn't have email. Now I first got I, my first email address. I got it in 1990. So I've had it for a long, long time, but a lot of people really didn't get email until middle nineties ish, uh, maybe even to the late nineties. Uh, how has your communication with, with pencilers changed from, from the days of uh, mail and FedEx and fax to emails. Um, that's yeah, FedEx, fax, and and phone. That was that was that was our lives back then. Yeah. Phone, fax, and FedEx. You still have um, a fax machine? Uh, no, I don't. But I, I did. <laughs> I used to have a Rolodex too. Oh yeah, yeah. I know you're big on those. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, I found you know I held those my cards, the, my old Rolodex cards up. Mm -hmm. I found a picture that Curtis Fujita sent me sitting at my desk that has the, that you can see my Rolodex in the picture. Well, if I didn't have the, the pencilers actual telephone number, mm -hmm. then I would contact my editor and say, okay. I'm, I'm having a trouble interpreting what this is on panel number three. Could you contact the penciler and ask? And they were, yeah. they were really good about getting back to me. Yeah. Yeah. It's funny. I, I, I can't think of any specifics off the top of my head, but I do recall having an occasional conversation with an, with an inker like that. It's like, I can't tell what this is. You, you need to, you need to tell me what it is or, or let me talk to the pencil or somehow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, so let's go ahead and talk about, since we're, we're talking about this, let's go ahead and talk about how your work has changed. And I don't mean your, the, the quality of your work, but I mean how your work has changed with the advent of, uh, of technology because everything you used to do was with literally wet ink on a, on a paper piece of paper. And now you do a lot of your work digitally. I do one. Well, I've learned to colors and that's a whole different uh, subject, but um, I, I do one book digitally and that's cat and mouse. Okay. Uh, just because the penciler, I think his style lends itself really well to digital. Um, but I'm still doing the other books that I'm working on. I'm still doing them old style. So like all of divinity was inked uh, old school. You can't hear me now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I realized you couldn't hear me. Uh, so yeah. all, all of divinity within was inked uh, old style, old school. It was. Yeah. Um, I'm still inking old school. I mean, the only thing that has really changed in that regard is that I no longer get the um, originals. Um, I get I get them sent ele electronically, and then I print them out. And when I first started doing that, I mean, when I first I, I took a hiatus for about a decade. Okay. Um, even though I had some a few pieces here and there that were coming out, pretty much I was I was stagnant for for a decade. And when I came back, everything was done electronically, and I was horrified. <laughs> I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't know how to get my my pages blue lined. Um, I didn't like the look of them because uh, I thought you couldn't see them as well as um, original pencils. Uh, and so the, at first, I had to have a friend blue line the pages for me, send me the files, and then I would print them out. Wow. Um, but... I finally, I, I, I have GIMP, 
which yep. is a which is a free Photoshop program right. type thing. Mm -hmm. And I finally figured it out how to do it myself. Um, so I I can do all of that myself now. I've come a long ways. Um, and I also clean up the pages on GIMP. I I, uh, I threshold it, the blue out once I've done it. And see, that's a whole other thing is, is learning the, the new way to do it. Yeah. After, you've, after you've printed out the pages on a blue line, and I use a Brother Pro because there aren't a lot of printers out there that can handle um, this this weight, this, right. this weight right. of paper um, without clogging. But the Brother Pro does a really good job of that. So once I've printed that out and I ink it and I'll scan it back in, um, I'll pull it up in GIMP and then I have to do a threshold to drop all the blue out because, uh, and just leave the black behind. And then my husband will go in afterwards and he'll, he'll find any uh, little dirt, I call it dirt. Right, uh, yeah. Little bits and pieces that are left behind on the on the darker blues that didn't completely drop out, and he'll um, erase those. And then once everything's uh, cleaned up, I'll send it off to the editor. And then that that's a far cry from when I first broke in. And everything was just um, shoved into a FedEx box and shipped off to <laughs> to the editor. And yeah. I mean, I would I would literally work up to the last second. I knew when my FedEx driver was going to come. You know, yep. came at the same time every day, so. I'm, I'd be like rushing. I was like, how much time left? How much time left? <laughs> <laughs> <You know>? uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Our, our FedEx, uh, uh, our FedEx delivery guy used to literally dolly in all the boxes every day. Uh, he would have a dolly and it was just stacked with FedEx boxes and uh, he would deliver them. And then one of our guys would come around and deliver the boxes to the, to the individual editors or whoever, you know, whoever got it. Uh, but yeah, it was, it was pretty incredible to see all those boxes delivered every day. And you could tell, the, you could tell the, the pencilers that smoked too, because you'd open up the FedEx box and it would just waft out of the FedEx uh -huh. box, the smoke, the nicotine and the, and oh, the smoke man. smells like, oh my God. Dan and David Day. Oh my gosh. I worked with them on a project. Uh, and wow, the smoke, you could almost see the smoke coming out of their box. Dennis uh, Jensen. Dennis Jensen was yeah. the, the, it was terrible about that. His page is just great. <laughs> I love his pencils. I, I just, I loved working on his pencils, but they did, his pages reap. Well, it says he has the same printer scanner and it's a great piece of equipment. Yes, it is. Uh, so uh, let's, uh, let's, let's backtrack just a, a, a moment. And you said you were, you were, you took a 10 year hiatus. Uh, can you talk about that? What caused you to take the uh, hiatus and then what caused you to jump back in? Um, there was about three different factors that caused me to, to, to jump out for a while. And, um, one of them was the, the industry imploded, you know, yeah. and, and my, my two editors that were my consistents, um, Paul Kupperberg and Kevin Dooley left DC and I relied on them a lot and they gave me anything and everything I wanted. So uh, it was really sad to see them go. Yeah. The DC had a huge turnover and they brought in, they wanted uh, new blood. They thought that that would improve you know, yeah. sales. <laughs> so it was, it was after a dozen years of being such a consistent and um, reputable uh, workhorse, I was reduced to knocking on doors again. And it was really disheartening and I was kind of burnt out. Yeah. Um, but even so, I would have stuck to it. But um, uh, my daughter had some health issues that I needed to attend to, um, and that cost money. And the the work was uh, spotty at that point. So my husband was like, "We need something consistent with health care." So I dropped out for family reasons, uh, more or less, um, and it turned into a decade. <laughs> Wow. which I wasn't expecting. And then um, I got a call from uh, IDW. They were working on a book called uh, Womanthology. And that's how oh, I got Oh, yeah. Back. Yeah. Oh, really? Okay. I'm, I'm featured yeah. in it. Yeah. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. I'm featured in like a big double page spread. And, wow. And I did a couple of the stories, ink a couple of the stories. And then I, I did the how-to um, for inking. Nice. Yeah. So that's kind of how I, I got back in. And huh. um Cause that was around 2012, something like that. Oh, I can tell you exactly. <laughs> it was like uh, 
2011. 2011, okay. So that's close. Yeah. Um, and I mean, comics, once you're in it, it's oh, yeah. it's in your blood forever. You, you constantly yearn for it. There were years when I was out of it that um, I couldn't watch Entertainment Tonight when they talked about San Diego Comic Con because I, I it was too painful. I yes. would just yearn to be there so bad because I'd gone for so many years. Um, but you know, needs must, and and yeah. you do for your family. Your family comes first. And Absolutely. When I, when I got back in, I actually had um, one of my former publishers who says, "Well, you must not have been very serious about it if you uh, if you got out." I'm like, what? I don't know about really? you. I don't know how much you love your family. <laughs> wow really they said that yeah yeah it oh really ticked me gosh. off yeah me too i mean it would have it, it ticks me off for you what the heck yeah i mean you you do what you got to do and sometimes it's painful for you and sometimes it, it it you have to put your own dreams aside uh for a while yeah and the hard part was when i got back in everybody had forgotten about me you know, yeah. it was like, who are you? Well, I've done like 200 books. Yeah. I mean, I've worked consistently throughout the entire 90s. Nope, never heard of you. Well, and and, and now I have a theory about that. And, and you can tell me if you agree with the theory. Um, I, I think a lot of it is because um, so many of the people who are in charge at the companies today, they, uh, they number one, weren't working in the industry at that point in time number two don't really know anything about it i mean they they get in the position that they're in but they don't really know anything about the industry uh what and and i think what i'm trying to say is that not just that they don't know anything about the industry but they don't really know about what's come before yeah they yeah. don't know their history yes and i think that's vital if you're gonna if you're going to edit the avengers you dog on well better know Steve Englehart's run and John Buscema when he was on the book and and the the classic Perez stuff and Roy Thomas's run. You you need to know those things, you know. And and, and I just you know I don't get it that I, yeah yeah I agree. When I came back in, everybody was it, it seems like my old crowd. Everybody was off doing other things. And this whole new crop of of editors and. Um, Artists were working. I didn't have a clue who they were. Yeah. I've learned. I've I've met a lot of them now. Once I got back in, I've made a, a a new circle of friends. Yeah, you know that I never had before. A pretty wide circle of friends. But when I first got back in, it was kind of overwhelming. I'm like, who are these people? I have no idea. Yeah, yeah. It uh, yeah. It, it changes. It changes pretty quickly. I, I, I think. Um, and I think, and I don't know, how, I don't know that we want to dwell there that long because I think this could ha have a, a tendency to get to, too negative. But aside from the fact that you've talked about, you know, an editor telling you, oh, you ink like a man, you obviously had some of the, to deal with some of the, the, the sexist um, attitudes out there, uh, which of course, you know, for me looking at, I mean, you've excelled uh, despite that. Um, persistence. Persistence, yeah. Uh, I, I would say, well, not in the 1980s or 90s, but today you've also got the, some of the some of the age things. Uh, yes, I think going on. And, and I've I got a double whammy there. I've you got. You have I'm, a double whammy. I'm, I'm yeah. a woman, and despite the vast and massive strides that women have made in comics, there is still a gap. Yeah. And um, there and there is a lot of ageism in comics. If, yeah. if somebody tells you there's no such thing as ageism in comics, unless you are a blazing superstar like George Perez, right? Or you know Walt Simonson, right? Oh yes, there is. Yeah. There's plenty of ageism in, in comics. Yeah. Because they always want the hot new young thing that uh, that's going to blaze blaze new trails and make them tons of money. That's right. And it's so funny that you say that because Wubba just said Marvel and DC seem to be looking for flash in the pan sales over longevity and history. Um, and I, I, I think I would have a tendency to agree that I, you know, I, I I'm, you know, people kind of laugh at me sometimes because I, I tend to be super indie guy. Uh, but I, I think part of the reason that I'm like that is because I, I find personally um, that independent comics have a tendency to be more, more inclusive. Uh, as far as I agree, the people who work in them, uh, and, and I think they've been that way for for a long time. Um, 
and and I think that's part of the reason I like them so much. I mean, aside from the corporate blah 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 blah, we which we we could get into, but I won't. Um, We're gonna save that for one of our future Silverline um, <laughs> shows because that'll be a two-hour program right oh, there. Oh my goodness, yes, yeah, it it it, uh, it would be. Um, so so let's let's talk about uh, what time is it? Let's talk about now. Um, how how did you? How did you go from getting back into the industry to finding yourself with Silverline? I mean, I know the answer. Oh, to that, that was, that's, a, that's an easy one. Yes, that's an easy one. Um, I was just, you know, kind of putting myself out there. I did uh, some projects with uh, Paul Kupperberg for Charlton, Charlton Neo, um, a few things for Empire Lab. And I was just kind of, uh, you know, trying to put my name back out there saying, hi, I'm still alive. And uh, one day, uh, Dean Zachary got a hold of me yep. and said, uh, would you be interested in working with me again? And I had worked with Dean at, on Nightman. Mm -hmm. uh, there's another title for Malibu that I forgot. Um, I, I've done Nightman with him. Witch Hunter is another one I, I did for Malibu. I'm, I'm remembering these now <laughs> at, way later. But anyway. Uh, and we worked really well together. Now, Dean has a, a very specific style. Yeah. Um, it's a little bit on the sketchy side, and there aren't many anchors that can can interpret his lines the way that he wants them, but I'm one yeah. of them. Yeah. And he has always really, really loved my inks. So when you guys got together and started talking about doing some projects, he contacted me and said, would you like to work with me again? And then, then you started talking to me, too. And it became us three. Yep. And so we were working on Cat and Mouse, and we were kind of throwing around some other projects, uh, possible future projects. And from that experience, Silverline was reborn. Yep. Yep. And I, and I, I I've never looked back. I have I haven't worked for anybody else. After that. <laughs> I I know that you were doing. Um, I, and I, I'm not going to say it here because I I like the people. Um, but I remember. Uh, there was uh, you had done uh, something else around the same time as, as cat and mouse. And uh, if I'm not, I don't know if Kickstarters were running at the same time or concurrent or they were pretty close. And I know that when it was all said and done, you're like, um, you know, I really like this because I made more on this project than I did on the other project. Um, and I think the other project had more backers. I can't remember if I had, I probably had more money, earned more money too. Um, and I always felt good about that because, you know, I, I try to I, I work really hard to be a good steward of of the money that's there. Try to, you know, be conscious of the money that we spend, because I know that in the end run, it's really going for the creators. And that made me incredibly happy to hear you say that. Uh, like I said, even though I, I have a lot of respect and like the the other the creators that you, you mentioned, um, I remember the first thing I told Dean when he mentioned that. And I don't know if Dean ever told you, Hyper Potato said, Nightman looks so good. Um, <laughs> Thank you. I remember Dean mentioned it to me and I said, well, dude, I, I don't, I don't know. And he said, why? He said, don't you like her inks? And I know I, I, I like Barb's inks a lot, but I don't know that she's, she would be willing to do it for, for the way that Silvan has to function because I just don't know that, that, that that's something that she's going to be willing to do. And he says, well, you know, I really like her stuff. I said, well, here's the deal. I said, I have never been one that's been shy. And I said, if you think that that, that uh, Barb is going to be interested in this, then I will absolutely ask her. And he said, yeah, I want you to do that. So I said, okay. Well, and then that's that's how I said, okay, Barb, here's how it, here's how it works. And and uh, I still and, remember, you're, you're like, I'm in. <laughs> yeah. And I've had a couple of other offers since I jumped on with Silverline. But truthfully, uh, Silverline is, is a, such a great group of people. People. I mean, we're all having so much fun doing yeah. what we're doing. I mean, nobody's in here to, to make themselves rich. Not yet, anyway. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's coming down the pike. Um, but <laughs> it's, 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 it's a group of people who want to be doing this, you know. And we're enjoying yes. each other's company. We like talking. Um, it, it's more of a family atmosphere. Very much so. Than, uh, than a corporate atmosphere. And um, I made the decision to throw my hat in for the long term because I believed in it. Yeah. 
I don't yeah. need the money. I'm retired. I have I have a nice retirement. I I'm doing this because I genuinely love comic books. Yeah. Uh, I love what I'm doing. I love the people that I'm working for, and I believe in it. So. Yeah. I don't need it to make me rich. Although that would be <laughs> nice benefit. It would be nice. A absolutely, it would be nice. Uh, yeah. Uh, and it's funny because uh, I, I, I had kind of made the silver line pitch to somebody and he said, you don't want to make money? I said, no, 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 no. You misunderstand me. <laughs> I, said, I said, that's not why I'm doing this. But yes, I absolutely want to make money. Of, of course I do. Oh, absolutely. And I'd love I'd love to get to the point where several issues down the road when we've got a few issues of Divinity under my belt, I'd like to shop at the Hollywood. You better believe it. <laughs> yes, right. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't yes. say no. Nope. Uh, I, I would not. Um, so, yeah. And, and hopefully, you know, and of course, you and I have talked a lot about this uh, in our board meetings and stuff. Uh, oh, man. Hold on, uh, Barb. We have a troll on Twitch, um, and they're posting stuff that that uh, I, I got to delete. Um, I'm, I apologize. Let me no, go ahead get over there. I can't. I, I've never had to do this this quickly. Um, let me see how I can do this. Um, it happens. Uh, it does. I've had my see. fair share of trolls. <laughs> Uh, my view. Trolls, stalkers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've had them all. Uh, crap, I'm not really sure how to do this. I know you can do it, but... Uh, crap. Bans? I need to ban. How do I ban? Uh, where's my son to help me with this? Block? Yes. Block. Yes. I hope. I don't know if that will get rid of the comments. Um, okay. I'll have to go back in and delete those others, but at least I think they've been blocked. Um, uh, ban. I'm going to ban them. Okay. So I don't know if that will delete all the comments. Uh, for those of you who happen to be watching on Twitch, I am uh, in, incredibly, I apologize incredibly for all these uh, nasty comments. Uh, I will delete them so that they're not on there much longer, but uh, I got to focus on, on our little time remaining with Barb. And I just closed my window. Barb, are you still there? Yep, I am. Okay, good. All right, here we go. Um, yeah, sorry about that, Barb, but um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, that's really the only place that we get any kind of uh, uh, comment trolls, and that's on uh, on on Twitch. And I think it's just like there's so many people hanging out on, on Twitch, which you know would be a nice platform. If uh, I wish they would add the subsection of comment uh, comics. Um, so let's talk about uh, we talked about Silverline, which kind of brings us up uh, up to date. Um, what would you, if you kind of had your, you know, druthers and stuff and wishes and all that kind of stuff, what, what would you like to see? Uh, I mean, assuming that we get out of COVID quarantine here and, and a, a reasonable amount of time, uh, what do you kind of foresee as the, as the future for divinity and, and uh, silver line and you inking and that kind of stuff? Uh, what do I see as the future? Yeah. Um, I do. I have been really impressed with the steam that Silverline has been building. Yeah, uh, it's it's been um, reaching more people and getting a, a good name for itself. Uh, I foresee pretty soon. I would like to see uh, conventions actually hosting us. Yeah, <laughs> that would be yeah. nice. Uh, yes, it would be. <laughs> hey, could you bring some Silverline <laughs> people in? Yep. Um, I foresee us being in comic book shops. Yep. Uh, that would be a huge dream. Yep. Um, soon, soon, I think. Yeah. Uh, I, I just see lots of good things happening. Uh, Divinity, I want it to be, I mean, Divinity is, is, uh, is the kind of book that's going to be, has such a massive cross appeal that I would love for it to become 
super popular. Yep. Um, trade paperbacks are, you know, graphic novels of it. Yeah. I just wanted to take. I just wanted to take off. Even you know, even if it just becomes uh, an, a niche book like Strangers in Paradise, that would be that would be it for me. Yeah. I, I would love it. It, didn't, <laughs> it wouldn't even have to be you know go to Hollywood or or, or anything like that. Is if it just found a market. Yeah, that would make my day. That would be everything I could ever have possibly dreamed of. Sustainability. Yeah. 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 Absolutely. Um, so Cassisi has a uh, a question. He says, "What advice do you have for up and coming writers and artists, etc.? What do you uh, comic creators? What advice do you have for the up and coming comic creator? Persistence. Persistence. <laughs> you just. I mean, it's so if true. You, <laughs> there, there's plenty of. Uh, would be comic book artists that will try for, you know, two, three, four years and just like, it's never going to happen. I just might as well give up. And that, that's never going to get you anywhere in life. Um, you've got to, you've got to keep practicing your skills. And if it doesn't happen the first time or the 10th time or the 50th time, it could happen the 51st time. Yeah. yeah. Um, keep honing your skills. Uh, if, if you go to a convention and you're an artist, um, have other artists look your work over and have, tell them to give you a, a critique and don't hold back. Yeah. Um, for one thing, if you can't take a harsh critique, you are in the wrong business. Uh, you know, anything in the entertainment business, whether it be music, books, movies, TV, um, comic books, are going to have harsh critics. And if, if you can't take the criticism, um, if, you, if it's too hot in the kitchen, you're, you don't belong in there. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> you, but the thing is when you listen to these critiques uh, don't take them personally and listen to what they have to say throw out the stuff that you completely don't agree with but keep those nuggets of information that you never thought to look at yeah. um, look at look at what they're saying and then look at the, the artwork that they're critiquing and, and try to see it from their point of view and you'll, a lot of times you'll go Oh, I never noticed that. Um, and take it home, rework it, rework it again, and practice more and practice more. If you're a writer, go to workshops. Um, take online courses if, if you can't afford to go to, to writing, you know, to Roland's classes. Um, keep writing. And um, I know this is probably sounds weird, but... Um, there's a lot of fan fiction writers out there, there that, that write fan fiction for years and all of a sudden are catapulted into professional writing because they've been writing for years. And the thing is they post their fan fictions on the internet and they get feedback. And, mm -hmm. and some of it can be pretty harsh. Why are you even bothering? But, you know, they finally, by doing it, they learn what works and what doesn't. Yeah, yeah. And I think that's the key. I, I think the key is, um, uh, as you mentioned earlier, persistence and doing it. Um, I will tell you this, since you mentioned uh, my students, one of the things that I see most common in the, in the attitude of my students is for some reason, there is this, uh, there's this prevailing attitude of, I just need to get my degree. And as soon as I get my degree, then someone is going to hire me to write their, their famous thing. Yes. I know. <laughs> and I tell them, no, 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 you got to make stuff. Uh, start make. Cause I, you know, I had a student one time say, uh, I asked him that he said he was going to do this. And then I was like, well, why, why are you waiting? He goes, well, I'm waiting until I graduate. And I'm like, but why are you waiting? Why are you? Well, I want to have the degree. No, do it now. There's no reason not to do it now. And, and, and for some reason, and writers are particularly bad about this bar. Writers are, for some reason, is like, I have written this, therefore here it is. <laughs> and it it's, can't be improved upon. No, yeah, they're not willing to. <laughs> they're not willing to revise and, re and, and and rewrite and listen to other opinions and editors. And they're like, yeah, I've written it. There, it must be this. And I'm like, no, no, you've got to work and work and work and work and work, and then you be able to finally figure out. Oh, so that's how you do this thing, and then do it some more. In the old um, days, it was a red pen. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Yep. Uh, Royal Airship says, uh, just followed Barb on DeviantArt. Loving your work. Um, thank you. And Cassisi says, thank you for the answer there. Um, and then he laughed at us talking about them. So, um, 
So, Barb, is there anything that I have not asked that you're like, well, why didn't why didn't, why didn't you ask this role? I really wanted to say this thing. Is there anything no, that you did a pretty good job? I just <laughs> wish I could have. My memory was would be better. I've I've forgotten a lot of stuff over over the years. That's okay. We'll forgive you. And, and and the thing about it is, if someone really wants to know, right, they can go look at your uh, bibliography. That's right. Right <laughs> to find out everything. On Comic Vine, I think. Comic Vine. Okay. So, um, yeah, if I can. If Not I can all of it. I mean, there, nobody ever gets everything. There, you, there was used to be a comic book database, and they had about ninety uh, percent of it. But they still. Do you have it. a list of everything? I do. Well. I, it's pages I, long. Pages. No, no, no. Here's it's here's my pages. here's my offer to you. If you will send that to me, we'll put it on your um, uh, your bio page on the Silverline website. Oh, that would be awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you know, the the thing I when I'm telling the, our creators about the bios, I'm like, I need a short one for the comic book, and and I need a really long one, or, or as long as you possibly want. For um, that gummit, there's another one there. Um, and I, and any as long as you want. I'm sorry, I got to ban another person here. Um, I don't know how to do this here. Users. Yeah, I have a shelf here in my studio that just has binders, just a whole line of binders, and it's everything I've ever done. I've kept track of. Uh, I've put a. a Every single book I've ever done, one copy of it goes into the binder, plus special articles or, you know, um, uh, reviews and stuff yeah. like that will go into it as well. So, yeah, I'm a little anal about yeah. it. That's okay. No, the thing about uh, the thing about our bio pages on, um, which is what I was trying to, to say, I got distracted for this, the, the troll again. Um, the thing about our pages on um, the Silverline website is it can be as long as you want. Uh, we don't have to, it's on the website, so we don't have to worry about space. Uh, oh, this is a good question, actually. Hyper Potato says, uh, do you have, do you still have some of your older art? I'm going to assume Hyper Potato is asking maybe, do you have some of your older art for sale? Most of it has gone to auction websites. Okay. Um, I have very, very few pages left, and those are my personal pieces that I have gotcha. kept. My favorite pieces. Yeah. Um, and of course, I, I will say Hyper Potato, Barb has been very generous uh, during the Kickstarters that we have run, uh, both for uh, Divinity and for Cat and Mouse, that uh, she has contributed uh, her work for uh, for reward tiers. So keep your eyes posted for the next uh, Kickstarter that she's involved with, and you can get some of her work there. You also have to remember that back in the day, um, the pencilers would get two-thirds of the pages back from the publisher and the anchor would only get one third of the pages back. So yeah. I would only end up with, you know, maybe maybe six or seven pages out of an issue. Um, but, and most of the ones that were really, really popular, like, uh, like the impulse pages is they, they sold really quick. Yeah. I, I, I could sell those. Yeah. Especially the, the Ethan Van Skyver pages. Uh, those went to auction uh, at an auction house and, I made some good money off those. Okay, wow. I was going to ask you, of course, the auction, that's a completely different thing. But, uh, uh, you know, I have seen my friends, um, you know, Tommy included, I have seen my friends sometimes sell a page. And then I think, you know, like a, a year later, it's like, wow, you sold that page for 50 bucks. You could probably get like a, 150 for it now, you know? <laughs> Do you, yes. You ever There's regret? pages I wish, really, really <laughs> wish yeah. I had. There's a She Hulk splash that I sold for. Back in like 1995 or something like that for 400 bucks. And I thought that was a lot of money back then. I could have, I could sell it for a thousand dollars now. Good grief. Yeah. I wish I had it back. Well, okay. So I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you the story. And, and um, I, this is one of the things. And then I guess we'll, we'll, we'll bring Tommy on if he wants to rejoin to say anything. Uh, at least we'll thank him. Uh, I tell my students a story in, um, in the class when we, when we talk, talking about going from, um, traditional to technology and how I've seen a number of um, the old guard uh, folks like Walter Simonson and stuff and, and things like that. Now, I don't know if he's since changed his mind. I've seen him talk about it a little bit, but I had a conversation with Jerry Bingham and um, Jerry said this, he, he, he talking about digital because uh, I asked him the question. 
He said, you know, the, the problem with going digital, he says, I, I, I lose my secondary revenue stream. Exactly. And I, and I said, can you explain that to me, Jerry? He said, yes, of course. He said, uh, he says, if, if I have an original piece of art, he says, I can sell it for $400. Um, he said, if I have, uh, if it's from a Batman book, he says, I can sell it for $600. He said, if Batman is on the page, <laughs> he said, I can sell it for $800 to $1,000 a page. He said, I'm not willing to go digital and give up that revenue stream, that potential right. revenue stream. Um, and I That's think, right. that, yeah. That's why I will never go completely digital. Um, usually the, the nice splashes um, on the books that I work on, I'll, I'll do those old school. Yeah. Yeah, I think they that, yeah, they sell. And I think that's nice because um, it also helps maintain a steady uh, influx of original barb work without flooding it or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah. So let me see if uh, Tommy, you want to uh, rejoin and say anything, say hello or anything. Uh, we definitely want to say thank you to Thomas Flormonti, who has been busy this whole time entertaining us with his inking of uh, uh, the project that he and I are working on with uh, a couple of other really talented folks by the name. Uh, the project's name is Trump's and the penciler is uh, Thomas Hedgeland and it's going to be colored by um, uh, Sid Vin Blue. So Tommy, he, okay, so I think he's going to probably try to connect here and jump on and, and say hello. At least he's, he's uh, gone off. Uh, Hyper Potato said, I overheard Darwin Cook at a show tell someone he would never go digital because it would be a pay cut. He made good money selling originals. Um, yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and the, another thing, here's here's another thing that, that uh, you can do to, for a pay stream um, is that you can turn your originals, e even your, your digital originals, into prints and yeah. sell them. So I not only at conventions, I sell my books, I sell my old books, um, I sell my original pages, and I sell prints that I have made from some of the pinups of my original pages. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've seen uh, my, my friend Jeff Whiting has done that. I know he's he had uh, Turtles pages that, not Turtles, uh, sorry. Um, Tick. Tick, thank you, Tommy. Uh, yep. Tick pages that uh, that were real popular amongst the fans. So he made prints, and he was able to sell sell those, uh, so he wouldn't completely run out of tick pages that he had. Um, so Tommy just wanted to—I don't know if you heard any what we what I said as you were uh, bailing there with the iPad. Just wanted to say uh, thank you for not a problem, the, not a problem. Last uh, almost two hours uh, streaming art for us to. Uh, visually entertain entertain our eyeballs while we found out everything about I Mark. appreciate it thank you for letting me uh, uh be part of your uh, your streaming thing here absolutely thank you, Barb. Oh, you're welcome yeah. i always enjoy having you on tommy you such <laughs> a little mean pole dance, the pole dance. <laughs> yeah. 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 i'm working on it that's the, a long the deal was, story there. the deal was if <laughs> i reach a certain point on my kickstarter he would do a pole dance on tiktok i have yet to yeah. see yeah. Yep. Well, they're they're <laughs> installing the poll on Wednesday, I believe, and then um, I'll uh, I'll start working on it. Yeah. Good to know. Cassisi said, "Amazing art, Tommy. Thank you for streaming as well." So appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you. All right. Well, we just want to again say thank you all, uh, and certainly we're happy if you want to leave some questions for Barb after the stream. Leave them in the comments. Be sure to tag her so she can uh, see it. She'll come on and answer anything that we might that I might not have asked tonight. And as we say with everything, make, make mine so Good night, everybody. <laughs> Let me try to end up here with the. Uh, oh wait a minute! How did I do that? Share my if screen. You run out of shut us off. Yeah. No, no, no. I've got to. I got to play the little out outgoing bumper. Oh. Right. Here we go. Uh, all right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Bye. All right. Are we